Hello, good afternoon. Today we're going to talk about persistent infections, the one, the type of infection very different from acute infections that remain with you for your entire life. So just to remind you, last time we talked about acute infections, which are rapid and self-limiting. Today, persistent infections, long-term, essentially the life of the host. They are stable, they don't change through the course of infection and they're characteristic for each virus. And I think as I've mentioned before, they begin as an acute infection that simply never gets cleared. So here are patterns again from last time and on the, on the top is our acute infection where we have a limited time period where viruses produce the viruses at the blue curve and time is on the bottom, virus production on the Y. The red is disease. So our acute infections can be associated with disease, but remember a good fraction of them may not be. They may be asymptomatic. And on the bottom here are three different kinds of persistent infections. Uh, and I call them all persistent infections, but in the literature they have different names. And one of them is latent for the herpes viruses, in particular herpes simplex virus. This, has, this is a persistent infection because it lasts the lifetime of the host. There are bouts of virus production which may or may not be associated with disease. Sometimes there's no virus produced, but the genome is always present. And the latent part means the genome is not being expressed. We'll talk about that today. And then we have two different kinds of persistent infections. Essentially, both the virus is produced for the lifetime of the host. One is asymptomatic and one is pathogenic. The bottom is characteristic of uh, SSPE after measles that we'll talk about today and HIV and AIDS, which we'll talk about later. So we're going to talk about a number of different persistent infections caused by distinct viruses today. They have some characteristics in common. They happen when the primary infection is not cleared. So you have that primary acute infection, which may or may not be symptomatic. It could be either way. Not cleared by the immune response and the infection lasts the lifetime of the host. Depending on the particular virus, sometimes virions are produced, sometimes just protein sometimes just genomes. We'll see for each one how they differ. In particular, herpes simplex viruses, we can find genomes in the absence of any protein or virus particles. There is no one mechanism that explains all the persistent infections. There are a number of properties that they have in common, and we'll talk about them today, but in general, if you want to say something that applies to all of them, uh, if you don't have cytopathic effects early in infection and you have reduced host defenses, uh, this is a recipe for a persistent infection. So the absence of cytopathic effect, if you remember, uh, we talked about how non-cytopathic viruses don't induce good immune responses because you don't get inflammation, you don't get a good adaptive response. So here, at the onset of a persistent infection, reduced cytopathic effects, reduced host defenses. But as you'll see in, in many of these, in persistent infections, we have modulation of host defenses in addition that allow the virus to persist. That there's antagonism of specific host defenses that fail to, as a result, the infection is not cleared and we get a persistent infection. Here is a list of some persistent human infections. We have the virus there on the left. We have where the virus persists in us and the consequences. And the ones with red asterisks we're gonna talk about today, and they include a variety of herpes viruses, Epstein-Barr cytomegalovirus simplex, and others actually, uh, hepatitis viruses, some polyomaviruses, and measles virus. And there's another herpes virus down at the bottom, varicella zoster virus. And there are other viruses that cause persistent infections we won't touch on. We'll touch on HIV in its own lecture later on. But you can see these viruses 
persist in different places in us, different tissues uh, and so forth, and some have no consequence. The adenovirus persistence, as far as we can uh, tell, has no uh, known consequence, uh, but many of the others do, but not always continuously. The pathogenesis, that is the signs and symptoms, may be intermittent, as you'll see for a lot of these infections. A key feature in common among all these persistent infections is antagonism of adaptive responses. So I want to remind you about the cytotoxic T lymphocyte response that we talked about a few sessions ago. And here we have an infected cell at the bottom, uh, which is displaying viral peptides in MHC molecules on the cell surface. And that peptide is recognized by a cytotoxic T lymphocyte by the T cell receptor, which recognizes the peptide in the context of the MHC molecule. And that, if that is a self cell, the CTL will kill it. And so this is a major way that viral infections are cleared. We talked about that. And it's also a major contributor to immunopathology because if tissues are destroyed, if cells are destroyed, that leads to tissue damage. So there has to be a balance, of course. So it turns out that many of the viruses that persist can interfere with CTL-mediated killing of infected self cells. So this is also a slide that we showed before. And this is the MHC1 system. Remember, there's MHC1 and MHC2 molecules on cell surfaces. These are the molecules that present antigens. The MHC1 is found on most cells in us. And these are the MHC molecules that would present viral peptides to CTLs. And then, again, if the peptide is foreign and it's in the context of an MHC, it would, the CTL would kill the cell. And so because this is such a powerful eliminator of virus-infected cells, viruses have evolved to counter this whole process. And in particular, the viruses shown here for the most part are either HIV or herpes viruses that cause lifetime persistent infections. So here on the top is a cytotoxic T lymphocyte, which is recognizing a viral peptide in the context of MHC1. And this is the infected cell at the bottom. Of course, this is the endogenous pathway of antigen presentation because it starts with viral proteins made in the infected cell. And uh, this, these proteins are digested by the proteasome. The peptides are loaded onto MHC through a transporter. And the MHC is assembled in the ER and transported up to the cell surface. And viral proteins interfere at every step. And this is partly why these viruses can persist. You have adenovirus and HIV, for example, interfering with transcription of MHC molecules. And these are viruses that cause persistent infections. We have some interference with the trafficking. Here, HIV, VPU is interfering with nuclear export of uh, MHCs. We have uh, interference. We have stimulation of the translocation of MHC from the ER to the cytosol. The MHC is not useful in the cytosol, of course, and so there it is degraded, so it never gets to the surface. We have viral proteins that inhibit the, the, the proteasome. We have viral proteins that inhibit the transporter of peptides, proteins that inhibit transport of MHC, uh, to the cell surface. And even if the MHC gets there, we have viral proteins that remove it, that downregulate it from the cell surface. So all this, of course, is an effort to avoid this infected cell being lysed by the CTL. If there's no MHC on the surface de uh, displaying viral peptides, then the cell is going to survive. And so that's a recipe for persistence. Of course, the virus can't kill the cell either, right? It's not going to persist if it kills the cell. Uh, or, so, so cytotoxicity also has to be modulated for many of these viruses. Although it's not an absolute. There are some cases where you have less cytotoxicity, but not zero. And you simply have enough cell and cells infected to maintain the infection. So antagonism of MHC1 is an important part of explaining why these viruses cause persistent infections.
But there is another component which is quite interesting, which is called CTL escape mutants. And it's shown here, it's been documented for a number of viruses, including herpes simplex and hepatitis C virus, two viruses we'll talk about today. So again on the right is our diagram of an infected self being killed by a CTL. The key here is that the viral peptide in orange is displayed on the cell surface on MHC1. We also know that antigen-presenting cells can present peptides on MHC2. And there's an APC, it could be a dendritic cell or a macrophage. So the peptide display can occur in the context of two different MHC molecules with two different functions. In one case, the MHC1 is involved in CTL lysis. On the other, on the APC, the MHC1 presents the peptide to a T cell or a B cell, which will then respond by activation if the peptide is foreign. So what can happen here is that Antigenic variation can occur such that the sequence of this viral peptide that's included on the MHC molecule changes. And often you only need one amino acid to change in this short sequence, and it will no longer bind the MHC molecule, where, whether it be on an APC or on an infected cell. So here we have an example where we're looking at MHC2 in the middle of this panel on the top left here. And there's a peptide of, of a number of amino acids being presented. It's bound to the MHC2. And that uh, APC will, of course, eventually present the peptide in the context of MHC2 to, here it's a, C, a CD8 positive T cell. So the peptide fits into the MHC, and it also fits into the T cell receptor. It's got to be recognized by both. Single amino acid changes could interfere with that process. Single amino acid changes, you can see, going in either direction on this diagram, one or two can prevent binding in the MHC molecule, uh, or they can prevent uh, recognition by the CD8 T cell. So you can imagine that as viruses replicate and they undergo mutation, they make proteins that are slightly different. If they can evade uh, antigen presentation or CTL lysis, then those viruses will be selected for. And this happens during these persistent infections, which are long-term infections. We can actually see the evolution of viruses that escape MHC presentation by simply introducing one amino acid changes uh, in the peptides. Okay, so again, we can escape killing by CD8s, or we can escape uh, antigen presentation uh, in the lymph node by CTL escape mutants. Now I've told you that these single amino acid changes in the peptides, they occur of course as part of a longer protein, which is then processed down. Uh, these changes can also affect proteasomal processing. So you know the viral protein has to go through that proteasome and it's chopped up into peptides and sometimes the amino acid changes occur such that the peptide isn't produced, it's kept as part of a longer protein, which doesn't load onto MHC2, it has to be a certain side to, size to load onto the MHC molecule, and a single amino acid could prevent its processing so it never makes it to MHC. So these uh, CTL escape mutants, th that's not the greatest name because they can uh, act at the level of CTL or antigen presentation, they can act at the level of peptide display in the MHC, or they can act at the level of proteasomal processing. So again, this is in, in addition to the MHC antagonism that we just uh, looked at. Now another interesting aspect of persistence is when the T cell dies instead of the target cell. So again, here is on the lower left our infected self being queried by a CD8 positive CTL. And I've told you that if this peptide is foreign, the CTL is going to kill the infected cell. Sometimes the infected cell kills the CTL. How about that for turning the tides on you? So the CTL doesn't kill the infected cell, but the infected cell kills the CTL. And so you can imagine that's a mechanism of evasion of CTL killing. So how does that happen? 
Well, on the surface of CTLs, there are a variety of receptors, and they're shown here on the right. They're TNF receptor, tumor necrosis factor receptors, FAS ligand receptors, and uh, DR4 receptors. What these all have in common is that when these receptors engage their ligands, it leads to apoptotic cell death. And so again, these are present on the T cell, and if the ligands happen to bind them, the T cell will die. And you may ask, why would we have such things on T cells? Well, it's a way to limit the proliferation of T cells. Remember, immune responses need to be regulated and uh, you can't let them go on forever. So at every step, we have ways of limiting immune responses. So to get rid of T cells when they're not needed any longer, uh, we can produce fast ligand, for example, which will bind to that middle receptor and induce programmed cell death. So viruses are remarkable. HIV and cytomegalovirus, when they infect cells, they induce fast ligand on the surface of the infected cell. And then when a CTL comes to query that infected cell, sees the peptide, before it can kill the cell, the fast ligand binds to the receptor on the T cell and the T cell dies. It's a great evasion, right? You just kill the killer. And so that, um, it was, as I said, it's normally present to limit immunopathology, but viruses have evolved to take advantage of that. Another way to avoid getting an infected cell killed. So you can see all these mechanisms lead to persistence of viruses uh, in the host. Another key component of persistence is that some organs in us have uh, reduced immune surveillance. You know, we call them immunoprivileged site, sites. They're not, that's not meant to be an absolute name. They're never completely devoid of immune responses, but they're very much reduced. And two of them include the CNS, the brain, and the eye. And if you think about it, you really don't want a lot of immune activity going on in these organs. If you get CTLs going in and lysing infected cells in the brain, not a good idea, especially when so many cells are non-renewable. So uh, we have evolved to avoid that. And in the eye, if again, it's a closed system with fluid in it, and if you have inflammation and CTL killing going on in there, that can have pathogenic consequences. So uh, these two areas are, are have very much reduced initiators and effectors of the immune response to avoid um, pathogenic consequence. And so that's why when a virus gets in the brain, can uh, do what it wants pretty much. That's why it, encephalitis is such a big deal because there's very little check on, on what is happening. Now certainly immune cells can come into the brain from the periphery and they do and that can be a problem, and it's part of the reason why the brain swells in encephalitis, and that can cause trouble. The eye, in particular, the aqueous humor has high levels of FAS ligand floating around. And that is, in case any CTLs get in there, they will be killed by the FAS ligand. Remember, it'll bind the receptor on the surface of the CTL and kill it, so the CTL will not damage the eye. In some tissues, better to preserve the tissue and let the virus replicate, perhaps with reduced consequence than to have the tissue damaged. Because you only have two eyes and one brain. You've got lots of muscles, so let the viruses replicate in the muscles. Uh, that's just my opinion, but that you get the idea. And so in these tissues, you often get persistent infections because of the reduced uh, immunological responses. I, I think this is very interesting that eye has high levels of fast ligand. That's a great way to, to protect it from CTLs. So let me give you an example of this. Uh, here's a paper from New England Journal uh, of Medicine. Persistence of Ebola virus in ocular fluid during uh, convalescence. And uh, there was a big outbreak of Ebola virus disease in West Africa a number of years ago. The biggest outbreak uh, we've seen, over 25,000 infections, way more than we've ever seen before. And so we had lots of individuals to study here, and you know, many of them died, but some did recover. And you can see among the survivors, complications that include uveitis can develop during convalescence. 
uveitis, inflammation of the eye. We'd never seen this before in, in Ebola outbreaks. Well, we didn't have enough of a patient population to see it. You know, the previous outbreaks, a few hundred cases, we never saw uveitis. And so in this paper, they study one patient. He recovered from Ebola virus disease, and then sometime later developed uveitis. He had trouble seeing. His eyes actually turned different colors. So he went for medical care, and they got infectious Ebola virus in the aqueous humor, the fluid inside the eye. And this was nine weeks after his viremia was cleared. And so they, you know, that's the measure for releasing you. You have no more viremia in these Ebola uh, disease patients. They release you. He had no reason to think he would have virus in the eye. And he had eye problems. He went back, and they found infectious virus. Good for them that they actually looked for infectious virus and didn't do just PCR, because we wouldn't know if there was infectious virus there just by PCR. Nine weeks after clearance. So likely what happened, some virus got in the eye and just remained there. We don't know if it was replicating in the eye or not. It was never cleared because of the immunoprivileged status of the eye. Uh, and then at some point, Maybe it began to replicate and cause his uveitis. And uh, this shows that the virus can persist in that place. Now, since then, we have learned that the virus can also persist in the testes, another kind of immunoprivileged organ where, again, it's a closed organ, and you don't want to have damage in there. And a number of individuals who recovered from Ebola virus disease were found to have virus in the testes weeks after their viremia cleared. Whether they transmit it, whether it is sexually transmissible or not, is not clear to me. There have been a few cases which suggest, but it's certainly rare among all the cases of EVD, Ebola virus disease. But it just, for our purposes, it illustrates that in the virus can hide out in certain immuno privileged places. And for the testes uh, as well, uh, Zika virus has been shown to hang out for a long time. Another way that viruses can cause persistent infections is that they can infect the actual cells of the immune system. What better way to persist than to infect the cells that are trying to eliminate you? And so we've talked before about measles virus infecting antigen-presenting cells skewing the Th response as a consequence, Im causing immunosuppression. And HIV, of course, infects uh, CD4 positive T cells, which are key for uh, generating adaptive responses, of course. They produce the cytokines that stimulate either antibody or CD8, CTL production. But the virus can also infect monocytes, macrophages, dendritic cells as well. So infecting the immune cells themselves is another strategy that allows the virus to remain around. So the first question today is, which of the following are features of persistent infections? They last the lifetime of the host. Viral immune modulation is involved. Immune cells may be infected. They may occur in areas of reduced immune surveillance or all of the above. Oh, look at that, your first 100%. <laughs> Congratulations. <laughs> of course, there are only 34 of you. So the others who are not here are the ones who've been screwing it up all this time. <laughs> so yes, all of the above is correct. So let's go through some viruses and talk about how they persist. Now here's measles virus, which we talked about last time as an acute infection, and this illustrates that sometimes you can have a virus with both properties. So measles, of course, a very contagious human virus can cause many deaths that are preventable, as I emphasized last time. Uh, infection gives you lifetime immunity, typical acute virus infection. You get virus in, it replicates, you have a defined period of disease, and if you don't die, the infection is cleared. Okay, so that's an acute infection. What about persistence? Well, there is a late uh, sequelae of measles called SSPE, subacute sclerosing panencephalitis. And as I mentioned last time, this is a progressive degenerating neurological disease. 
What is it? So after measles, kids recover. One in a million later, six to eight years later, develop this disease. They progressively lose their motor function, their cognitive functions, 100% fatal. They all die. So this is some kind of a persistent infection. We really don't understand it very well. What we do know is that viral nucleoprotein particles can be detected in the brain of these kids. We find them post-mortem, but no infectious virus. Just RNA protein complex. So There's a negative stranded RNA virus, so the RNA is complex with protein, so that's why it's a ribonucleoprotein, and that's what you can find in the brain. And that seems to be able to spread throughout the CNS synaptically from neuron to neuron via synapses. So it, apparently this RNA can move within the cell, exit at the synapse, cross the synapse, and then get into another cell that way and spread throughout the brain. So you don't need apparently virus particles in the brain for this to happen. Why it happens is not clear. It's not clear if these are rare cases where the virus remains in the CNS, because remember there is a certain what is it, one in a thousand measles acute infections leads to encephalitis, so the virus can get in there. Something might have gone wrong in these individuals, or maybe, you know, we just don't know. What we do know is that it is a quite rare uh, complication, and now it's even rare because we, we have less than a million cases a year of uh, measles globally. But it's another reason to get immunized, because even though it's rare, you don't want this to happen, right? So it's an example of a, a persistent infection that starts out uh, as an acute infection. Okay, next are polyomaviruses. These are family of small, double-stranded DNA containing viruses. We talked about these quite a bit uh, in the form of SV40. We use that as a model for understanding DNA replication, this circular double-stranded DNA, how it replicates from a single origin. So they, these viruses all are structured similarly, and this is a phylogenetic tree showing uh, the relationship of different polyomaviruses. There are quite a few that have been identified from uh, different species. You can see clearly uh, bird polyomaviruses. Uh, there's a group called the Wookiee polyomaviruses, which are isolated from Wookiees, right? Of course not, there's no such thing as a Wookiee. But I think the name is cute, so I, I always say that every year. <laughs> Wookiee comes from uh, the name of two of these viruses, WU, Washington University, which is where it was isolated, and KI was isolated at the Karolinska Institute in Sweden. So these are Wookiee polyomaviruses. And the ones in uh, red asterisks, those are the ones that we have isolated from humans. So all of these Wookiee viruses come from humans. Merkel cell polyomavirus that causes a rare skin cancer, BK and JC, these are all isolated from humans. And these are, these can cause persistent virus infections. And in fact, we've talked about them before. In the very first lecture, we talked about how uh, these viruses infect most people and we can actually trace human movement by looking at who's been infected with which ones. You get infected very early on. Typically, it's passed in the family to the children. And if you look, you do serological tests, you see very high positivity in human populations against these human polyomaviruses. They infect very, very different organs, including kidney, intestine, and the respiratory tract. And you can find a lot of these viruses in urine. So, not everyone is shedding these all the time. I think the pattern is that you tend to shed these viruses. They're replicating in your kidney, and they, you shed them in bursts. But you can shed a lot of uh, particles in urine. And um, I tell you, I always think of this when I go into a men's room, because you know, when you flush a urinal, you make an aerosol. So you're inhaling others' polyomaviruses, for sure. Actually, toilets make aerosols too, so women are not excluded from this lovely uh, incident. Women uh, use the toilet, you flush it, and you're having a plume of the previous person's polyomaviruses. But apparently it's not a problem, right? Because we all, we all do this. We don't know 
uh, the mechanism of persistence. But here, clearly, virus particles are present throughout your whole life. They're not continuously present, but there are bursts of virus production. And how that happens, we have no idea. They obviously aren't sufficiently cytopathic to destroy your kidney, right? Because you still have kidneys. Uh, so we don't really understand them. What we do know is that there is a disease called PML, progressive multifocal leukoencephalopathy. And what happens here is you're being treated for multiple sclerosis. And what they do, one of the treatments is a monoclonal antibody called Tisabri, which immunosuppresses you effectively. And it really can be effective for treating MS, but because it immunosuppresses, it allows your polyomaviruses to rise to high titers. And in some people, they go in your brain and they cause this disease. It's a brain disease. And so you have to be aware of this if you're treating a patient this way, that if they're showing neurological symptoms, you have to withdraw the tisabri because it's immunosuppressing them. So those are the persistent polyomaviruses. And again, you see already two different patterns here. Measles virus, the infectious virus is present initially, and then later it's not infectious but persisting. You know, polyomaviruses, they're present throughout your life as infectious viruses. And you're going to see a lot of different variations on that. Here's hepatitis B virus. Uh, this is transmitted by blood exposure, which can happen at childbirth. It can happen through a transfusion. It can happen during sex. It can happen during drug use, intravenous drug use, using reusing needles, of course. Tattooing has been known to do it. Uh, nosocomial infections as well. One year I had a guy who always sat in the front row. He was completely tattooed. And I... I got a little hard on tattooing, and he came up afterwards, and he said, you know, I know where to go to get good tattoos. <laughs> <laughs> so it's true. You have to make sure you go to a reputable tattoo artist. The best, as I said, the best person would be a doctor, but they probably are not good artists, so <laughs> you wouldn't want to go to them. The, actually, the main uh, way this is transmitted uh, globally is, is at childbirth. So many people are infected in parts of the world. They have kids, and they, they pass the virus on to their kids. This uh, principally infects the liver cell, the hepatocyte, and uh, it's mostly an acute infection. So 95% of adults, if you get this as an adult, 95% resolve the acute infection, but only 5 to 10% of newborns. So they uh, acquire the virus and keep it for their lifetime, pretty much. And that's the persistent part of this story. Here are the numbers from WHO, this is viral hep B in, in the world. You know, there are lots of hepatitis viruses. There is A, there is B, there is C, there is D, there is E, and there is G. F got left out. Um, and they're all different virus families. So this is viral hepatitis B. It's 257 million people infected globally. And you can see the parts of the world that have uh, the highest burden of infection. So if you have a lot of people who are infected and you don't do anything about it, they pass it on to their kids and it keeps going on and on and on. And we do have uh, antivirals uh, for this virus, but apparently they're not sufficiently used. So here are the two schemes of pathogenesis that illustrate an acute uh, and a chronic infection. So on the left is acute infection. You acquire the virus and uh, after, say, four weeks or so. So we're looking at, on the y-axis, a number of different parameters. On the x-axis is time, weeks post-exposure. And the first thing you can see is the red, the hepatitis B surface antigen. That is the protein that constitutes the outer uh, layer of this virus particle. Remember, it's a icosahedral particle with a gap double-stranded DNA genome, and around it uh, is a membrane full of viral glycoproteins, and those are the FB surface antigens. So they go up pretty quickly, uh, and at that point, uh, when that peaks, you also get a peak in the liver enzyme, alanine transaminase. So this is assayed in the blood. This should not be in the blood. So it's, it belongs inside of liver cells. So if you see it in the blood, it tells you that liver cells are being damaged and it's leaking out into the blood. So it's a nice measure for hepatocyte damage. You can see that peaks in there is when you have your symptoms of uh, acute hepatitis, which of course include becoming yellow, jaundiced. What else is happening here? We have uh, antibody being produced. Well, first of all, HBV DNA also peaks around the time of disease. 
Uh, then we have IgM antibody made first. It goes up and down r rapidly. And then uh, well after the symptoms, 32 weeks, your uh, IgG uh, antibody comes up. And then eventually this infection is cleared. So after a year, it takes almost a year, no more genomes, no more proteins are present. And again, most people can, most adults will clear this infection. However, in f about 5% of adults and most children who are infected less than a year of age, they develop the chronic hepatitis B, which is shown on the right. Again, increase of surface antigen, similar kinetics, but it doesn't go down. It continues for the lifetime of the host. The liver enzymes uh, peak and then go down slightly, but they're always elevated. So there's always liver cell damage occurring. The viral DNA is always present. But interestingly, the symptoms are still defined to a very specific timing in the infectious cycle. So these people are chronically infected, persistently infected for their lifetimes, uh, but they're often asymptomatic after that initial uh, symptomatic period. So what's going on here? Interestingly, the virus is not cytopathic. It does not kill liver cells. Uh, what kills the liver cell are the cytotoxic T lymphocytes, recognizing viral peptides displayed on the surface of the hepatocytes. And so this goes on for long periods of time. The CTLs are destroying your liver. The CTLs eventually become exhausted, uh, which is a common phenomenon. It happens often in tumors. So you can't clear the infection and any CTLs that are around are killing hepatocytes. So this goes on for many years. You get a period of cell killing, then the cells regenerate, then they're killed, and that causes fibrosis, eventually cirrhosis, and then liver failure and death. And some cases, uh, these patients will develop cancer, hepatocellular carcinoma. After 20 or 30 years of this chronic infection, and I say often asymptomatic, you don't know, you have no symptoms, these individuals will develop liver cancer. So this cycle of cells being killed and regenerating and killed and being regenerated is a, is a recipe for getting cancer. So these individuals develop liver cancer. And, because, and this is the main problem, that you develop liver cancer after this persistent infection. And it's why we'd like to make the world uh, hep B free. This particular virus only infects people, so it should be possible uh, to get rid of it. But we need a good vaccine and good uh, antivirals. Another virus uh, that causes hepatitis, hepatitis C virus, it's a different family. It's a flavivirus, it's an RNA virus, a plus-stranded RNA virus with an envelope. Same virus family as Zika virus, West Nile virus, yellow fever virus, etc. Uh, this is also transmitted by exposure to contaminated blood, sex, drug use, tattooing, and, and at birth. At the moment, we have 70-some uh, million people infected globally, another chart from WHO, viral hepatitis C. And you can see the global distribution of cases there of those 71 million. This used to be higher, but now we actually have very effective antivirals that can be used to essentially cure hep C infection. You can give combination two drugs or three drugs and eliminate infection no latent reservoir, there's no integration, so you can actually achieve a cure. And eventually, if you got the right people, you would presumably be able to stop transmission. Here's the course of the disease. So initially, you're, you acquire uh, the virus by those routes we talked about. You developed an acute infection, hepatitis, elevated ALT in the blood, showing damage of liver cells, jaundice, uh, the yellowing of the whites of the eyes is a telltale sign of that. 10 to 40% of those people will go on to eliminate infection and recover and never have an issue, and that takes about three to six months. But 60 to 90% of the initially infected people will have a persistent infection, and that's associated with different signs and symptoms, you get chronic liver infection, and then these individuals a fraction of them go on to be infected for 30 years or so. Uh, 70 to 98% of them have an asymptomatic persistent infection for their entire life. Uh, others enter uh, end-stage liver disease. 2 to 30% develop cirrhosis, 
hepatocellular carcinoma, and they, they will eventually die. So you can see there's a fraction of individuals who develop persistent infections and a fraction of them who die. And on the bottom is a similar graph as we saw for hep B. We're looking at the months after infection. On the left side is the viral RNA uh, in the serum, and on the right is ALT, the liver enzyme in the serum. So you can see initially the acute infection uh, in patients who clear, those are the solid lines. You have a peak in the viral RNA. So clearance is red. That's the first peak. That's viral RNA. And that's months it takes to clear. Uh, persistence is blue for RNA now. And you can see the RNA goes on for at least a year, which is the length of, of this particular study. And then in individuals who have cleared the ALTs and dotted red lines, you can see a defined peak of disease. And in the individuals in which the virus persists, the ALT continues. And how this virus persists is via multiple immune me modulation mechanisms, including antagonizing uh, interferon, uh, CTL escape mutants, uh, and so forth. Now this uh, has, the, the incidence of hep C has increased in recent years in the US because of the opioid epidemic. More and more people are using injected opioids. They are using, reusing needles to inject it, and they're contaminated with hep C, and they're passing hep C from one to another. And so these numbers are from the 10-year period, 2004 to 2014. And you can see um, we have the year on the bottom here. We have admissions for uh, opioid treatment, and then we have hepatitis C on the right. So the hep C uh, is in orange, and you can see in, in the last few years this has gone up dramatically, and it goes up with uh, the opioid use, uh, increase in opioid use here, 134% for the drug, 300% for the hep C. And this, is, this pattern is continuing. I've looked for some more recent statistics. Uh, opioid use is still increasing, and that, along with that, hepatitis C. So as long as we keep putting new hep C infections into the population, it'll be hard to uh, eliminate it. But as I said, this can be eliminated with antiviral treatment. Next question is, which are shared features of persistent infections with polyomavirus, hepatitis B virus, and hepatitis C virus? The genomes are present, but not expressed. Liver damage, kidney damage, virions are produced, all of the above. So the answer is uh, virions are produced. So it's a shared features of polyoma, HBV, and HCV. So A is, is not right. They're present, but not expressed. Remember. Polyomaviruses, you're often making virus particles. HPV and HCV, you're always making virus particles. So that can't be right. Uh, liver damage, I didn't tell you that for um, polyomaviruses. In fact, it's not. It doesn't ki damage the kidney or the liver, and that's part of the puzzle. Well, how can the viruses be produced for so long? It's not kidney damage. So it's not all of the above. So it's just, virions are produced in every one of these three. That's the commonality. All infections, virus particles are produced. And that's particularly important because uh, when we uh, talk about the next set of viruses, not all of them are going to be making infectious particles all the time. So this, now we get into what we call the latent infections, just a di different form of persistent infection, uh, where there's a period where the genome is present, but viral proteins aren't made. So viral proteins are not made or found in low concentrations. Uh, and the infected cells are not well recognized. That's something we should have already known from what we talked about. And then the genome persists. And at periods after the initial infection, we have activation or reactivation of the genome, make new infectious particles. And that's how infection is spread to another host. So think of it this way, if, you, if a virus infected a host and caused a, pers a latent infection or a persistent infection without making virus particles, that would serve no purpose for the virus because it wouldn't be able to spread to different hosts. You have to, at some point, be able to make infectious viruses uh, to spread in the population. Many of the viruses we just talked about do that. 
And as you see, even these latent viruses where there's only a genome and no virus, at some point they have to reactivate to make more viruses. And so we're talking about herpes viruses now of different sorts. And as you will see, the genome is different in different herpes virus infections. In some cases, it's a non-replicating DNA in a non-replicating, uh, non-dividing cell. So uh, herpes simplex and varicella zoster virus. The genome is not replicating, and it's in neurons which don't replicate, so everything works out well. In other herpes viruses, the list shown there, including papillomavirus, the, the DNA is an autonomous self-replicating DNA in a self in a dividing cell. So the DNA is replicating, and as the cell divides, the genomes partition between the two cells. And then in one unique instance, human herpes virus 6, the viral DNA actually integrates into the host chromosome. So it replicates along with the host. And so we'll talk about uh, some of these mechanisms now. And let's start with herpes simplex viruses. In the US, serological surveys have shown that over 80% of the population is seropositive for this virus. And in fact, as you look older and older, you, the number gets higher and higher. And all these individuals have viral genomes in your peripheral nervous system. Not your central, but your peripheral nervous system. And these individuals, there are millions of them in the US, and there are many in this room, have no symptoms. 40 million people ex experience recurrent herpes disease. I know many people who routinely on a monthly basis, every two weeks or once a month, get a cold sore, which is a reactivation of a latent herpes virus infection. And that reflects the presence of virus particles being shed. And there are many people who have herpes in their ganglia, but never have a cold sore. But they're still shedding virus particles from time to time. Uh, there are two herpes viruses, type 1 and 2. Type 1 tends to infect the oral area, type 2. Uh, it tends to infect the genital area. And this is a pattern, as you'll see, of a well-adapted pathogen. It doesn't cause a lot of disease, remains with the host, yet is able to reactivate and transmit to another host from time to time. So here's how the infection works. You often get infected in utero or during birth. 80% of babies uh, get infected at birth from their parent who is shedding uh, virus. If you're not infected at birth, shortly afterwards, as your parents are kissing you, their saliva has herpes viruses in it. It will infect you as well. The virus enters uh, mucosal surfaces. You can see here. Uh, this could be the upper respiratory tract, for example. If this were a sexually transmitted virus happening later in life, herpes simplex 2, these would be uh, the mucosa of the genital tract. The virus enters these cells, replicates in them, can then leave at the basal lateral side. And then the virus enters nerve termini. You know, there are lots of sensory nerves under your skin, for example. There are other nerves throughout the tissues. These viruses can enter the nerve termini. They are transported uh, to the ganglia, the cell body, which is in the ganglia. And there they become latent. And so the infection begins as an acute infection with a defined period. And then the viruses enter the nerve cell bodies in the ganglia and become latent or silent. And here, here are some more facts, a short incubation period. That primary infection can be inapparent, or you can get cold sores, you can get other lesions and so forth in that primary infection. So now the virus has gone from a epithelial surface to a latent state in the nerve cell body in the ganglia. So the ganglia is a connection of nerve cell bodies. And leading out of them are the fibers, the nerve fibers. And so in the nucleus, there's the viral DNA. It is silenced. It is coated with nucleosomes and silenced by chromatin modification. There are probably multiple copies in each nucleus. But the neurons don't divide, so the viral DNA doesn't have to divide either. So it doesn't. Those DNA copies remain as they are, silenced. And herpes, herpes, unlike love, is forever. <laughs> you cannot get rid of it. You can go online and find many people, and I get emails all the time telling me about Dr. So-and-so who cured my herpes. It ain't so. Can't happen unless you want to cut out all your ganglia. 
And in fact, some people have that operation done for other reasons, but you cannot cure this latent DNA with drugs or vaccines. It's with you forever. You have to prevent the initial infection. This uh, DNA, as I said, is silent. The only thing that is made from this genome is a small RNA called the latency-associated transcript and some microRNAs from the viral genome. No proteins are made, no messenger RNAs are made. And we think that uh, RNA silencing is in part important to maintain the genome in this latent state, and probably the host makes a contribution as well. So many of us have these viral genomes in our peripheral nerve ganglia. As I said, this virus has to infect another host to be successful, otherwise it dies with you, and we call that reactivation, when the DNA starts to be expressed and form virus particles. So in each ganglia, a small number of neurons reactivate. They've synthesized virus particles. They travel down the nerve by anterograde transport. They infect the epithelial cells that are innervated by this particular ganglia. Uh, if these are in your mouth or on your lips, the virus is shed, and that's how you spread it to someone else. You spread it by kissing or by just talking, and the virus is spraying onto someone else. And uh, the immune response is too slow because of viral antagonisms of the sort that we've uh, just talked about. So before this is halted, the virus has already moved on to the epithelium. And as I said, some people have this happen routinely every few weeks, others never, but even if you don't see a cold sore, you're still shedding virus. What causes reactivation? So here is where the virus is latent. If you are infected with a type 1 orally, you get infected in the nasopharynx. The virus travels up these nerves to the trigeminal ganglion. There's one on each side of your head there, and it remains latent there. And then when it's reactivated, the virus goes back down. You can get fever sores on your lips, uh, around your eye. Even I've seen them in nose as well. Now. Uh, there is a disease called trigeminal neuralgia, where people have intense facial pain. And one of the solutions is to take out the trigeminal ganglion. And sometimes this relieves the pain. It will remove the herpes virus. Typically, they only take one out, so the other side may have herpes virus in it as well. But it was actually a study of these uh, resected trigeminal ganglia that revealed to us that that is the hiding place uh, for herpes simplex virus. All right, reactivation. Stress causes reactivation. Sunburn, if you get sunburn, you will often get a fever sore because there's UV light reactivating physical or emotional stress. I, I stress you four times a year with my exams. They cause a, a fever sore, nerve damage, hormones, steroids, a lot of things that cause stress. And what they do is they stimulate the production of viral proteins to activate the transcription program. Now, what is cool here, and was a puzzle for many years, we know that VP16 is essential for the cascade of transcription. Remember, I told you this weeks ago. VP16 is in the virus particle. It activates the immediate early promoter, which then is needed for all the subsequent transcription. Without VP16, this was even an exam question, without VP16, you can't get viral transcription. The conundrum was VP16 is a late protein. So how can it, how do you make it when you reactivate herpes from ganglia? Well, the, the solution is right here. At least in one form of uh, latency, here's a ganglia at the top with a latent genome. It is chromatinized, it's wrapped around histones, it's silenced by uh, marks on the histones here, in particular methylations of different sorts. Neuronal stress activates protein kinases in your neurons. And these protein kinases phosphorylate histones and partially reverse the repressive state caused by methylation. And in this first phase, after phosphorylation of the histones by the kinases activated by neuronal stress, all the classes of transcripts are made at the same time. There's no cascade. For some reason, they're all activated, and that allows you to make VP16, which can then go 
and bind to the immediate early promoter and turn on everything. And so the, sec the second phase is full reactivation where you have a cascade of transcription at full levels and that's associated with uh, histone demethylases that take all the repressive marks, uh, acetylate the histones so they're fully active. So at least in at this example, this is neuronal stress, that's what we think happens. It removes the epigenetic silencers that uh, keep the genome silent. The next question is, persistence of herpes simplex virus and nerve ganglia requires which of the following? Continuous episomal DNA replication, low level production of virions, silencing of all gene expression except LAT and microRNA, UV light stress or steroids, all of the above. All right, so most of you said all of the above, but that's not right. The right answer is silencing of all gene expression except LAT and microRNA. You don't have DNA replication. The genome goes in, neurons don't replicate, the genome doesn't have to replicate. You don't have low level production of virions. No, this is a, the key here is that there's no virions produced unless it's reactivated. So everything is silenced except LAT and microRNA. Stress, et cetera, is used for reactivation, not persistence. So it's not all of the above. The next herpes virus, Epstein-Barr virus. It's 95% of US adults are seropositive and carry EBV genomes, again, for your lifetime. It resides in B lymphocytes. We typically acquire infection at an early age, although many college students are still seronegative and then they get infected uh, as uh, in their four years of college, actually. It's quite common to get infected. This virus can cause a number of diseases, including infectious mononucleosis and a variety of uh, human cancers, actually, which we may touch on when we talk about cancers. Again, you acquire infection via respiratory secretions, typically from your parent or someone you have close contact with. And we're showing virus infecting the oropharyngeal epithelium. On the left, the virus replicates in the epithelium, passes through the uh, basolateral surface of the cell, and then it can infect B cells. So this virus has a unique propensity for B cells. It infects them, and it causes them to actually go through the differentiation process that they would normally do if they saw antigen in lymph, in lymph node. And they eventually, a fraction of these uh, infected B cells eventually become memory B cells, and, they, and that's how the genome persists in you, as memory B cells with the latent viral genome. These cells make uh, some viral proteins. As you can see, LMP1 and 2 are viral proteins on the cell surface. Uh, sometimes they are, uh, if they reactivate and start to replicate the genome, they will be killed by cytotoxic T cells. But because the virus encodes many immune antagonism features, uh, a lot of these infected cells that get reactivated will eventually make it unscathed, they will escape CTL killing, make their way back to the uh, epithelium, the mucosal epithelium. So here now is a B cell shedding virus. It will infect the mucosal cells and be spread to another person here by a saliva. So the key here is that latency occurs in B cells. As the cells reactivate, many of them are eliminated, but some escape, they go to the surface and release infectious virus. So here, B cells are essential for EBV latency. The DNA is self-replicating uh, in cells associated with nucleosomes. It makes a limited repertoire of viral genes, not as silent as herpes simplex virus. These B cells that are lately infected uh, go to the bone marrow and lymphoid organs. And as I said, they're not killed uh, unless reactivation occurs. So these latently infected B cells are not killed because the CTLs don't recognize them. If they do get reactivated, there are enough immune modulating mechanisms to escape CTL killing. Another one that persists for your lifetime. Here's a third herpes virus, varicella zoster virus, which you acquire in childhood. Well, in the old days you did anyway before vaccines uh, by inhaling respiratory aerosols. Uh, the virus would replicate in the oropharynx in local lymph nodes, uh, primary viremia spread to other organs, secondary viremia, infection of the skin, and then the typical rash of chickenpox. So varicella is another word for
for chickenpox rash. It's shown there at the upper left. And so this is a childhood rash disease, which we now vaccinate against and has pretty much been restricted because of that. The infection of the uh, skin leads to virus penetrating sensory neurons. They become latent in the sensory ganglia that innervate the skin, and they remain there until many years later. So if you get infection as a kid, maybe in your 50s or 60s, these genomes reactivate, virus travels to the skin, and you get herpes zoster or shingles. So that virus of chickenpox remains with you your whole life, and then at some point, and we don't quite understand the reactivation here, but the stimulus, you get shingles, and this typically occurs, the rash occurs on, typically on your ribs, but it can occur elsewhere on your body and along one level of a dermatome that's innervated by a particular uh, ganglion. So now we have a vaccine that prevents childhood chickenpox, so eventually shingles will no longer be a thing, but there are plenty of people like me who had chicken pox as a kid, and for us, there's actually a shingles vaccine. So you can get this, you know, whatever age you are, if you, if you had natural chicken pox, get a shingles vaccine, it will prevent this. Uh, so uh, as I said, before a vaccine, most adults got infected. 30% develop zoster around 50 years of age. In terms of latency, this is episomal DNA in neurons, non-replicating. There is some viral gene expression, so it's very different from herpes. Again, a couple of viral genes are expressed. We don't understand uh, what triggers the reactivation. Cytomegalovirus is our next herpes virus. Again, high seroprevalence globally, transmitted by respiratory uh, aerosols, as well as uh, urine and sex and replicates in peripheral blood leukocytes and endothelial cells. This is a chart of um, seropositivity, CMV IgG versus age in different uh, ethnic groups. And you can see increasing seropositivity, seropositivity reaching 100% uh, by 75 years of age. And again, this is a virus that infects and remains with you for your entire life. Uh, the primary infection, typically asymptomatic, you shed virus in saliva for months to years after that primary infection. Uh, it's, it's resolved, but uh, you have latently infected myeloid cells. And these are these cells here. These get latently infected, and we can find virus in monocytes and macrophages uh, and even in dendritic cells. So these are the sites of latency. And periodically, it can be reactivated to replicate to higher titers. HCMV is a particular problem in organ transplantation because everyone has this virus. When you get an organ transplant, you're immunosuppressed to prevent rejection, but that allows CMV to replicate, and this can have serious consequences. So a whole, as we do more and more organ transplants, a whole new field of transplant infectious diseases has arisen to deal with this. This virus can cross the placenta and cause serious congenital birth defects. And here's a chart of the numbers. Out of 1,000 pregnancies that lead uh, to live birth, you can have women with CMV before or women that get CMV uh, during pregnancy. In the end, one to two babies will have permanent birth defects caused by virus infection. So one to two out of 1,000 live births irrespective of the CMV prevalence. Now, so this has been a known problem for many years. This and a couple of other viruses can cross the placenta and cause congenital birth defects. And I remember when Zika virus emerged a number of years ago and was shown to also cause congenital birth defects. I spoke to a number of reporters who had no idea that CMV could also do the same thing, or that rubella virus could also do the same thing. But they're, if anything, more of a problem, because far more people are infected with uh, CMV uh, than with Zika virus. Our last question for today, what do persistent infections with EBV, VZV, and CMV have in common? B cells are essential, may cause congenital birth defects, viral DNA persists as an episome, the factors governing reactivation are well known or all of the above? So the answer is viral DNA persists as an episome, which some of you, most of you got. 
B cells are only essential for EBV. Congenital birth defects, only CMV. And nobody got the gov factors governing reactivation, which is good. Our last herpes viruses are human herpes viruses 6 and 7, which cause a rash disease of kids called sixth disease. If you count all the rash diseases kids used to be able to get, this was the sixth one. It's a mild rash, as you can see in this child here on the upper left. Most of us have been infected by the time we're adults. It's spread by respiratory secretions, parent to child. The virus infects lymphoid, endothelial, liver, CNS, and salivary cells and remains latent in a variety of cells, as you can see here, uh, depending on the particular virus, HHV6 uh, or 7. What is interesting about this, and again, this is among all these herpes viruses that stay with you forever. That's why on day one I said, you all have some herpes virus infection, is that this one, HHV6 in particular, seems to integrate into the chromosome. Um, in some cell types, the viral DNA is integrated into telomeres, the sequences at the ends of our chromosomes. Here is a uh, chromosome at the top, telomeric region. The chromosome is blue, the telomere is red. And at the end, we have repeated sequences, which were established there in the beginning of development, it slowly get shorter and shorter and shorter but they last our lifetime, so we don't lose the ends of our DNA, because remember the end problem? Well, that solves it for us. These viruses also have telomeric repeats in their genome. That middle line is a viral genome, HHV6, and in about 1% of people, it seems to integrate, uh, the virus integrates into the telomere at the end. So here now we have a chromosome with the viral DNA integrated at the very end hanging off. So uh, this then gets transmitted by the germline from parents to child. So it's an interesting way of establishing latency by actually integrating. This is the only herpes virus that we know of that integrates into the DNA. So let me leave you with this really interesting slide, which is the estimated burden of chronic viral infection in humans. And what we have here on the bottom x-axis, we have different viruses that we know uh, can cause chronic infections or persistent infections. And then on the y-axis, the number in terms of the global population. And so all the way on the right is endogenous retrovirus, which as you know is in everyone on the planet. We all have endogenous retroviruses, so that bar is everyone. So you can use that as a gauge to compare the others. And then we have next to it anelloviruses, which are small single-stranded DNA viruses in, in the blood supply, which we can't get rid of. And then we have herpes viruses 6, 7, varicella zoster, Epstein-Barr, cytomegalovirus. Look, almost all of the population. And then some polyomaviruses, which we talked about today. There's herpes simplex viruses, hep B. So now hep B is down a, a notch, right? Only few hundred million people right there, then papillomaviruses, hep C, adenoviruses, and there's HIV, 35 million people. So much of the world has multiple persistent virus infections. So why is this important? For many reasons, obviously it impacts our health. But one thing I wanna leave you with is, let's say you have a human disease and you don't know what the cause of it is and you wanna compare two populations and say, this population has the disease and this doesn't, what's the difference? There are many diseases like that, we don't know what causes them, we'd like to know. The problem is, what you're lacking is virus in one of the two populations. You can never have a population that lacks anelovirus because they don't exist, everyone's infected. So how could you say with the etiology of a disease unless you rule out viral contributions? And so that's the problem that we have to deal with. We can't really establish disease etiology without uh, taking into consideration all the people who are persistently infected. All right, next time we're gonna talk about transformation and oncogenesis, how viruses can cause cancer.